So, today morning, we are discussing one of the most formative incidents in the Srimad Bhagavatam, where we have Brahmaji responding to the Lord's call by sitting in meditation. So, I'll speak today on the broad topic of how spiritual awakening occurs. We can look at this from our own lives. Many of us are involved in trying to get others to come to bhakti. So, why is it that some people, they just are so ripe and ready for receiving spirituality? And they respond so enthusiastically. And why is it that for some others, it just doesn't happen? So, broadly speaking, there is some combination in spiritual awakening of the mystical and the rational. So, something mysterious happens, which look makes people look upward look beyond the normal way of living and in this case in the case of brahmaji it is the sound tapa tapa that as he is saying apashyamanaha he is looking around and there is no explanation there is no one over here who could have spoken this so there is something mysterious that happens, something mystical, something strange, something, Prabhupada didn't like the word mystical so much, he often used it, mystical is misty. So we could say transcendental, divine, something beyond. So, and then there is a rational component, component to it. So the rational component is here, that he heard and he said, okay, I can't figure out what to do. There is, I, and there is some direction coming. I don't know from where that direction is coming, but that seems to be the sensible thing to do. So, as far as possible, it's only this rational component that is accessible or analyzable for us. The transcendental component, it's just the mystical component, is the magic of Krishna working. And that's why, you know, we cannot have devotees produced like a factory line. You know, sometimes some people do that. You know, okay, you, you speak this message and people will be convinced. And you do this and they will come to, you take them to Yatra, they will take to this, come to this many rounds. Now, sometimes it can happen, but there has to be some deep internal awakening that occurs with it. So, the mystical and the rational. When sociologists, especially those who social, study sociology of religion or psychology of religion, they try to analyze why do religions, demographics go up or why do certain religions spread or certain religions go down, they can only analyze the rational aspect of it. And there is value in that, no doubt. So this dynamic of the mystical and the rational it's good to try to get a sense of the mystical, but it's important to focus on the rational because that's what is objectively observable. The mystical is what a person has experienced inside them. We'll try to understand that. And I'll focus on an acronym FAR. How far does a person go in their spiritual journey? Some people, when you present spirituality, they go far away. <laughs> they just say that, I don't want anything to do with this. Hmm? And some people go a little distance and they say, okay, that's enough. Hmm? I was talking with, uh, recently, I've been when I've been traveling abroad, I've been trying to reconnect with my school and college friends. Now they are settled all over the world in various places. So when I meet them, some of them were also, they had started their spirituality at that with me in college. And then one of them said, you know, yeah, I believe in soul, I believe in God, I believe in reincarnation. And he said, my spirituality is a project 
for my next lifetime. <laughs> so he said, I did something, yeah, it's valuable, but it's not something for me right now. So why do different people go different distances? So we'll try to look at three factors to illustrate, to analyze this. So the first is the common experience of everyone in life. That is frustration. Mm -hmm. See, now the way I'm going to depict this is there is a human journey going on. We are in the human world. And mostly people want to go ahead in the human journey. Okay, where I am, maybe I get more wealth, I get more fame. Nowadays, that means I get more Instagram followers. You know, I want to become an influencer. So there is a straight path. Now, within the straight path, there can be many varieties. So I may want to become an engineer, somebody want to become a doctor, this. But all of them are in the same straight dimension. Most people seek growth within the material dimension. Now, there are a few who start seeking growth in, toward the spiritual dimension. So, Krishna himself says, these are Manushyanam Sahasreshu. There are very, very few. So, what prompts them to do that? So, we'll talk about two factors. One which is external and negative. One which is external and positive. And one which is internal, rising from within. Hmm? Which is of course, you can connect with transcendental. So the negative is frustration. So everybody experiences frustration in life in some way or the other, some time or the other. And for most people, frustration with the material, that is what opens them to the possibility of the spiritual. Now frustration can go over a wide range. It can just be a dissatisfaction that, oh, you know, I had this dream and I achieved this. You know, I wanted to get this degree, I want to get this kind of house, I wanted to be in this kind of relationship. And I've got that and it's not fulfilling. So frustration, dissatisfaction is basically, often I'm talking specifically desires fulfilled at least some desires fulfilled, heart not fulfilled. So, okay, is there any problem? Thanks. Dose of mercy. <laughs> so, this is where people, it's not that there is something radically wrong in their lives, but there is something missing in my life. And that missing makes them look for something more. And Majority of the people who turn towards spirituality are from this demographic. We'll see 20, 25 years ago, not many Indians were interested in spirituality. Religion was always a part of it, but that was more a cultural thing. But now, as say India has risen to a certain level of prosperity, along with prosperity, a certain set of problems have come. Because when there is poverty, the focus generally goes in the straight direction. I want to get money. Now, Indians are, at least a significant part of Indians, are quite rich. The middle class is burgeoning, some have gone to the upper middle class. And then you feel, hey, there has to be something more in life. And that's why people start exploring spirituality. So it could be dissatisfaction. But it can also be devastation. Hmm? Devastation could be because of bereavement. Bereavement means somebody loses a loved one. It could be because of heartbreak. Mm. Uh, somebody's uh, an important relationship just completely breaks apart. You know. The people use the word break up, but mostly there is no up, it's only break down. <laughs> <laughs> so, now beyond that, there could be also some, some fatal diagnosis that maybe you have a fatal or at least a lethal diagnosis that you're going to die or you have a serious disease. So that, so basically, the normal fabric of reality that we have built around ourselves just crumbles. Hmm? 
whatever gave meaning to our life, it just gone completely. So at that time, any of these frustrations can make a person look for something more. So artho, artharthi, these are categories in that 7.14. So this is broadly related with 7.14. Now, jigyasu also, there is some dissatisfaction in curiosity. There could be hundreds of things a person could be curious about. Why would that person be curious about spirituality? There is something dissatisfaction, something missing in life. So broadly, frustration is often the starting point for people when they embark on their spiritual journey. Now, Srila Prabhupada, in one lecture which he gave to the... Uh, when the Rathyatra was going on, so a lot of people from the counterculture, some of the whom were hippies, had assembled over there. And Prabhupada in the lecture says that, in your society, you are not appreciated very much. You are considered frustrated people. He says, I appreciate you. He says, human life is meant to be frustrated. <laughs> and he says, Athato Brahma Jigyasa. That it is when we are frustrated with the material that we will inquire about the spiritual. Now, this is a remarkable insight in his commentary to the Vedan Sutra Ramanacharya in his Sri Bhashya. He gives almost a hundred page commentary on just the first verse, Athato Brahma Jigyasa. Now, when Prabhupada presents Athato Brahma Jigyasa, it's more like a call. We should inquire about spirituality. Hmm? So that Athato Brahma Jigyasa, that particular verse can be seen in two different ways. Prabhupada's reading is more that it is an instruction, it is a call. Now that we have got human life, we should inquire about the ultimate reality. Uh, Ram, uh, this is how Shila Prabhupada sees this. Ramanacharya, he sees it as an inclination. He, now that's not the only way he sees this. But he says that some people have that inclination for Brahma Jigyasa and many don't. So why do these people have it? And he gives various factors of analysis. His analysis is something similar to what Vishwanath Chikritakur does in Madhurya Kadampani about what attracts people to Krishna. How do people come to Bhakti? Now coming to Bhakti is a more specific form of Brahma Jigyasa. Brahma Jigyasa is a broad spiritual inquiry. But the point is, there's elaborate analysis over there. So Brahma Jigyasa, that awakening of Brahma Jigyasa is actually a mystery. It's not so easy for that to happen. But frustration is a common denominator to some degree. As I said, it could be dissatisfaction, it could be devastation. And this is where <clears throat> one of the challenges comes up for us, for our movement, uh, when we try to do outreach in the West, that Bhakti is for Western people, or in general for non-Indians, Bhakti is actually extremely expensive. What do we mean by expensive? Expensive not in terms of money, but in terms of culture, and conception. See, generally when a person is frustrated, they will seek relief from the frustration by going toward a familiar source of relief. So if the mainstream culture in the West is Christianity, then people may have gone to church sometimes in their childhood, vocationally, and when they are frustrated, the first place they will go to is the church. Or if they are born a Jew family, they will go towards a synagogue. So in India, when a person is dissatisfied, when a person is looking for something bigger in life, naturally they will gravitate towards a temple. Because that's the majority religion over here. That is a broader culture. So now, for somebody, when life becomes uncomfortable, normally, amid un when there is discomfort, we go towards the familiar, not the unfamiliar. Hmm? This is much easier. So now bhakti, it's culturally unfamiliar for many people. It's culturally expensive. Why culturally expensive? Okay, you have to change your dress completely. 
you have to eat a different kind of food, you have to wear a different kind of marks. And mostly when people come to explore something spiritual, there's some curiosity that it might be there. And, but because there is so much cultural change that is to be made, so people have a lot of cultural curiosity. See, curiosity does not cost much. But the leap from cultural curiosity to cultural commitment costs a lot. And that is difficult. Like anybody can come and dance in a kirtan and they enjoy it. Nowadays people may even like to take a selfie, oh I danced in a kirtan. Yeah, Hare Krishna kirtan. But what happens for many of us is, if somebody is enthusiastic dancing in kirtan, oh and they say I had such a great experience. Okay, tomorrow morning you can come for Mangalarti at 4.30. <laughs> now that is too big a cultural commitment for them and they not only come tomorrow come every day well so what happens it's the it's not just the specifics of waking up in the morning but the broad culture it is difficult i was in australia in a farm and there was one uh, lady who had come there i'm australian lady sir she uh, she saw me we started talking while she was she said i come for the first time and she said i have a question I said, yes. He says, when you people blow this uh, conch, why does everyone kiss the floor? <laughs> why, <laughs> why does everyone kiss the floor? <laughs> now, from their perspective, it's such a bizarre practice. So, there was one young man, he was telling me that uh, when he came to a temple for the first time, you know, his girlfriend brought him to the temple. And he said, we came in the same car, but when I came to the temple, we were told to sit separately. And he said, I was all alone over there, surrounded by Indians, and I couldn't make head or tail of what was happening. So he said, after that, he said, I'm never going to come here. Then, when he was later on introduced to a Western Outreach Center, where such gender boundaries were not so rigidly imposed, it was culturally relatively more comfortable for him. So the point is that, in the West, even churches, men and women sit together. So, there is there is certain amount of cultural expense which is difficult. So when somebody is frustrated, you tell them to do something which is already more difficult for them. So culturally, even conceptually, what is going on over here? Curiosity is one thing, but commitment is a different thing. Now, of course, there are people who will be attracted because generally there are politically people on the left and people on the right. So people on the right, they those are conservatives, they seek order. Mm -hmm. And people on the left, naturally, this is almost like their people are different, people are neurologically wired differently. So people who are on the left, they seek to disrupt order. So generally, people in the West who, when they want to explore something spiritual, they come to us, they are mostly left-oriented. And people in India who come to spirituality, they are right-oriented. And that's why you'll see people who are left-oriented, they will be much more sympathetic, even if they're in their religious practices or religious sympathies towards the minority religion. Now, if you see the left values and the Islamic values, they're radically different. Left wants equality, Islam has the highest hierarchy among all religions, rigid hierarchies of every kind, gender and others. And yet there is this almost inexplicable nexus between the left and Islam. Why? Because in places where Islam is in minority, the, the people with leftist tendencies, their idea is disrupt the existing order. So even when they are in distress, when they seek relief, their relief will not be going toward the tradition, but disrupting the tradition. So yes, people can come amid frustration through the minority path also. So we are the minority in the West. That's why people with the leftist inclination come to... come to... <clears throat> come to in uh, India, uh, come to Bhakti. And that's why when I was in America for three months, there were so many American devotees repeatedly were asking me this question. He said, I, I never thought, not, not older devotees, but younger devotees, I never thought I would see this day, he said. I thought I'm practicing Indian spirituality, but you know what kind of country is India that you build a temple after destroying a mosque, and then the whole country celebrates that. And the Prime Minister of the country goes and celebrates that. You know, do I really want to belong to an intolerant religion like this? 
Now you go backward and say, it's not just a mosque. The temple was destroyed by building a temple was built by destroying a mosque. The mosque was built by destroying a temple. Now that is true, but you know what happens in recent history is what they, we should be accountable for. What happened in distant history, don't bother about it. It's a fractured view, but the leftist view is there's a lot of sympathy for Islam. And this happens within the devotee community also. Of course, if people come to India and experience that the, what the myth of intolerance, as is portrayed in New York Times and Guardian, as compared to what is the reality, is very different. But the point I'm making is that in frustration, different people go in different directions. So frustration is the first thing that prompts people. And after that, I've hinted a second point. The acronym I was going to discuss was FAR. A is association. So, essentially, everybody follows someone or the other. So, for somebody to take to a spiritual path, they need to find someone who, to use the Western language, who is cooler than the person whom they were following before. So, that could be somebody who is interested in music, and they find somebody, hey, this person is so good at music. They like to hear speeches, and this person is a great speaker. They like to feel comforted and welcomed, and uh, they love hospitality and belonging. And they find somebody who is very attentive and caring. And that's what attracts them. So, what in association will attract whom? That will vary from person to person. But what kind of people a person meets? Hmm. That is vital. So association is the positive influence. See, many people become frustrated, but very few among frustrated people actually turn towards spirituality because they don't meet the right association. And in fact, if they meet the wrong association, they not only go away, they often become anti also. I was in Texas, and Texas is part of the Bible Belt in America where there's a lot of uh, evangelical religion. You know, for a, we in India, Thing, for us, America is Hollywood and materialism. But actually, in the Western world, America is the most religious country as compared to Russia, as compared to France or UK or Australia or New Zealand or any of the, Canada for that matter. America is the most religious country. In fact, I was in New Zealand and I was talking, okay, so they were talking with a Kiwi person. He said, so I said, where, where all do you travel? He said, travel to America. Oh, oh, those are those religious nuts who elected Trump. So they treat America to be a country of religious nuts. So America is almost like two countries. The liberal part, the coastal parts are very liberal. The central and the southern parts are quite conservative and religious. Anyway, so the point is that America is quite a religious country. And so in Texas, I was going for a program and there was a school, uh, there was a car and the car had a bumper sticker and it said oh god please save me from your preachers <laughs> please save me from your preachers the idea was that if the preachers are holier than thou if the preachers are condescending the preachers are saying you're going to go to hell if you don't follow me then people say i don't want to i don't care for such preachers in fact, that has decreased, and sociologists say that it is because of, the, because of the influence of bhakti, bhakti spirituality and the vision of a god of love that came from India, that Christians have started focusing less on the Old Testament God who sends people to hell, and more on Jesus as an embodiment of unconditional love. So their idea of God as an embodiment of love, that is now the focus of the churches which are becoming popular and to some extent the influence that's the influence of Indic spirituality but the point is what kind of association a person gets that shapes their spiritual search a lot and that's where our responsibility comes in uh, Srila Prabhupada gave different answers to this question at different times at one time Prabhupada was asked that mm, the, what will determine how much Krishna consciousness spreads? And Prabhupada said, it depends on the preachers. It depends on how, how and how much they preach. So, association is a key factor. And it's not just association, it is association that can attract and inspire people. 
just having a, a community of priests or preachers alone is not enough. They need to have that capacity, that magnetism, at least if not the magnetism, at least the intelligence to conduct themselves in a way that attracts others to Krishna. That's why if you see in the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, in 12.13 to 20, when Krishna gives the qualities that endear a devotee to him, there it's interesting the qualities that Krishna is describing are not devotional qualities. In the sense that they are not about devotional activities. Krishna does not say a devotee who wakes up and comes from Mangal Arati will be, I'll be, is dear to me. A devotee who chants 16 rounds is dear to me. A devotee who fasts on Ekadashi is dear to me. A devotee who is a Nirjala Ekadashi is dear to me. Krishna doesn't say any of these things. All the qualities Krishna mentions are behavioral qualities. Advesta Sarva Bhutana Maitra Karuna Evacha One who is friendly, one who is compassionate, one who is composed. Yasma no dvijate loko, loka no dvijate chaya. One who does not agitate others and one who is not agitated by others. In fact, you know, when you read the Bhagavad Gita again and again, each time you just, it's like you feel as if you never read the Bhagavad Gita. In fact, when I started doing Western outreach and one devotee showed me this verse, I couldn't believe actually this verse was in the Gita. So, wh why was it? Because in many ways, the way I grew up or the way I was trained, I thought the definition of a preacher is one who agitates others and one who is agitated by others. <laughs> the idea is, you should be agitated. So many people are living materialistically, sinfully, you should be agitated. You should feel angry and agitated how, how people are living. And what is preaching if not agitating others? People are living comfortably, you have to agitate others. Well. There is some truth to that, but most people when they seek spirituality, they, are, they want something calming and uplifting. So generally, those who are agitated and who agitate others, they will also attract followers. But those followers are who become extremists and fanatics. So every religious demographic, it's not that fanatics are born. Nobody is born with a label fanatic. Just because somebody is born in a particular religion, they don't become fanatic. It is people whose definition of preaching is the opposite of what Krishna is saying. That not one, so what does it mean? Don't, don't be agitated by others and don't agitate others. That means we behave in a way, everybody is disturbed in the world. And we want to show people the path to becoming more peaceful, to finding a higher purpose and meaning in their lives. And those who have the opposite qualities, they can also be devotees. See, Krishna doesn't reject those who do not manifest these behavioral qualities. But what happens is, those devotees who do not have these behavioral qualities, they are liabilities for Krishna. Like a parent accepts all children. Now a child might be very mischievous, irresponsible. The parent will not reject the child. But the parent cannot entrust anything to that child. Isn't it? So like that, devotees who don't have broadly sattvic qualities, they are also accepted by Krishna. Apichet sudharacharo bhajate imam ananya bhag Krishna says. That even those who do sinful activities, he considers them devotees. But the problem is, if these behavioral qualities, they are present and they are absent. Now, devotees can have both. So those when they are absent, those devotees are liabilities for Krishna and for Krishna's mission where people speak harshly, people speak inappropriately, and then they create a mess which others have to clean up. I was talking with one of our uh, devotees who is in mediation, and he was telling me that samsara davan alidhaloka, he said that, you know, we are meant to extinguish the forest fires of material existence, but he says most of our energy is going in extinguishing the forest fires that we ourselves have lit. <laughs> that means somebody among us has only lit that. So that happens when devotees somehow lack these behavioral qualities. So this is, when they are at present, then such devotees are assets for Krishna. And that's why when Srila Prabhupada was asked, how do we know your followers? He didn't say that they follow four regulated principles, they chant 16 rounds. Yeah, that's true. This was a journalist asking him. It's definitely true. I'm in no way minimizing the importance of devotional activities and devotional qualities. 
I'm saying that in this particular context, if we are to be a part of those who can bring about spiritual awakening in others, then what is important? So Prabhupada said, my followers are perfect gentlemen and ladies. Prabhupada was echoing, using contemporary language, what Krishna is saying in 12, 13 to 20. So essentially, this is the mood of most people who are interested, spiritual seekers. They say, don't tell me what you believe. Now, everybody can have what you believe and everybody can present it in their own way. Don't tell me what you believe. Show me how you behave. So it is our behavior that will primarily attract people. So now what we believe is undoubtedly important. But how we behave is much more important. So it's association that can attract people. And in many ways, the destruction or the, the fall of the Vedic tradition happened not just because there were so many invaders, but it was primarily because of the discriminatory caste system, where those in the higher caste, rather than showing people the way upward, started simply enjoying their privilege and the power that came from keeping people down. So Bhagavatam also says that the, the downfall, the onset of Kaliuga began because of a not some aggressor coming and destroying, but because of a Brahmana misusing his power. That is Shringi cursing Parikshit Maharaj. So the point is association, how it functions, that plays a large role in how spiritual awakening occurs. And that brings me to the last part. What is the acronym we are discussing? R, yes. So R is reactivation. Now, reactivation can refer either to something which is intrinsic to the soul, that every person is a soul and every soul has spiritual longing, or it can refer to a previous life's practice. So now, what exactly is intrinsic to the soul? There is some, some debate among the Gaudiya theologians. Prabhupada took the position that love for Krishna is there within every living being, dormant. Now, there are other Gaudiyas who say that actually love for Krishna is what is given by Guru. But the broad spiritual propensity is there, whatever be it. There is some capacity for spiritual awakening that is there intrinsic in everyone. And beyond that, if somebody has practiced spirituality previously, then that can be awakened. So Krishna talks about this in 643 to 45. Purva It's a very beautiful phrase, Krishna says. Riyate. Riyate means is attracted. How avasha. Normally the word avasha is used in a negative sense. Like I am helpless against my conditionings. Or the Bhagavad also says that. Bhutva bhutva praliyate, avasha, that again and again we are, there's destruction that happens. But here the word avasha is used in the Bhagavad Gita in a positive sense. That it's almost as if without our conscious intention or control, we are just attracted towards spirituality. And you know how Krishna will attract, it's a great mystery. Mm. When we meet devotees, we generally ask the question, how you came to Krishna, how did you come to Krishna consciousness? Generally, if we are in the West, we are meeting people, they may not have yet come to Krishna consciousness, but they are on a spiritual journey. So we ask them, how did your spiritual journey start off? So when I meet people, Americans, I talk with them, just, it's amazing how, what that purva abhyas, you know, what will awake, what will trigger an awakening? Now, if we consider, the Bhagavatam itself, uh, there is this spiritual awakening happening in Gajendra. And that what triggered it was, if you go back, frustration. Hmm? It is said that when he just couldn't overcome that crocodile and its grip, then at that time what he had remembered in the previous life he remembered. So basically in this acronym F-A-R, this Frustration and association are the rational part. I said there's a rational and the mystical. So this reactivation, that is a mystical part. You know, what will actually trigger awakening? That is difficult to know. Now the Bhagavatam is not exactly clear 
with respect to Gajendra's story, that he remembered from the past. Now, is it that he had exactly offered the same prayer in the past life, and he verbatim repeated the prayer? Well, that's unlikely, because he also mentions that he is caught in a pash. He's caught in the, now he doesn't explicitly mention the crocodile, but he says, Pash, I have, I'm caught in a noose. So unless there was an identical incident in the previous life where he was caught in the Pash, we could say he remembered the principle and then he articulated in, in his own words over here. So at least some part of his prayers is clearly contextual, where he says that I don't mind dying right now. Mm. So he says, so he, he doesn't mind dying. So basically, generally when this spiritual awakening occurs, mm, it is not necessarily in terms of cognitive information. It's not that a person remembers something specific from a previous life. But so it, it's a, a person who has practiced a lot of bhakti in their previous life, it's not that when they are born in the next life, the, the newborn baby will be chanting Hare Krishna instead of crying. No, and it's, but, say, like with respect to Mahaprabhu, he would like a small, normal child, he would cry. But when Kirtans were there, he would calm down. So, like that, there is some attraction that is there. So I met this, met one, one person who is a scholar of religion, he is specialized in Hinduism, with a focus on Gaudiya Vaishnavism. So I told him, you know, what attracted him, what started his spiritual journey. And he said that, I just fell in love with the Sanskrit script. That's interesting, the script. He said, when I read the Sanskrit script, he said, this seemed to be like uh, mathematical symbols to me. You know, if you see how Sanskrit is right, it's like calligraphy or mathematical symbols. I just, when I read the script, I said, I have to understand what the script is saying. And that's how we learned Sanskrit and that's how we came to spirituality. So that reawakening, what it will be. For somebody else, it might be that, that say, they just feel a pull towards some festival. You know, the Rathyatra is going on, the Kirtan is going on. Now, there could be some, one thing which is just a cultural curiosity, casual curiosity. But some people just feel pulled towards it. Indrasandha Maharaj writes some stories in his Diary of Travelling Preacher, how you know, there was this young girl, she saw the devotees and she told her parents, this is in Poland, which is a Catholic country, she said, I want to go to this festival. The parents were hardcore Catholics, no, she said, I want to go. And they came there, and when she came there, it was like almost most people over there in their festival of India, especially women, they go to the, their favorite place is the, the Gopi Dots and the Sari festival, Sari stall where you put gopi dots on the face and henna on the hands. And I go, but this small girl just went straight to the deities of Jagannath. And she was just beholding them. So this is Purva Bhya Sena Tenaiva Riyate Yavashopisa. So which aspect of Krishna will cause awakening in whom? How and when? That we can't predict. And that is the mystical part. So when Prabhupada says in the uh, prayers of Queen Kunti, that uh, section, you know, we create a soothing atmosphere in the temple hall. We create an attractive ambience. And some element of that ambience will attract people. So which element it will be, we can't know. But some element will attract. And that's how the spiritual awakening occurs. I'll conclude with the last point. That the spiritual awakening is not just necessarily a one-time event. Where, okay, now this person has become a devotee. The spiritual awakening can also be an ongoing event. Because for us also at different times, you know, frustration may prompt us to become more serious about our relationship with Krishna. Sometimes some association will give us some inspiration. Maybe a devotee speaks a kind word, a devotee shares a flash of insight. Maybe a devotee does, has developed a particular skill or ability which just mesmerizes us. Feel like, hey, I want to do this also, whatever it is. And something for us also, because when you say the Jeeva Jago, Jeeva Jago, it's, it's an incremental awakening from sleep. Hmm? So we are all in the process of waking up. We can't say we all have already woken up. Yeah, certainly we can say we are 
more awakened than people who are just living materialistically. But it's a ongoing process. And we all, while we do our sadhana, it's important for us to do our sadhana, do our seva. But in many ways, this is the rational aspect of it. Now, this is what we are told and this is what we understand will bring about that spiritual awakening. But beyond our rational, our, our rational exercise, no, we have to be open to the mystical. Because every day we come for darshan, one day the darshan seems extraordinarily attractive. No, every day we do our chanting, some days maybe we feel, oh, it's like I don't want chanting to end, I want to chant more than 16 rounds. We feel some strength, we feel some connection. Other days, we take out our beads and we see, you know, has somebody changed it from 108 to 1008 beads? <laughs> this is just not ending. So, we cannot have a mathematical pathway. You know, okay, you have a sadhana card every day, you have woken up at this time, you have done this much, you have this much, therefore you, are a, you have advanced devotee. Well, yes, you know, we certainly have to do our part, not devaluing a diligence in doing our part. But we cannot reduce bhakti to the mere exercise of diligence on our part. Like the two fingers which were needed for Mother Yashoda to tie Krishna. So that one finger was the, our endeavor. So we use our rational intelligence to do what we understand will awaken us spiritually. At the same time, we have to be open to the fact that there is a mystical element to the mercy, the grace that will actually bring about that spiritual awakening. Sevon Mukhehi Jivadav. That is the rational part. And Spurityadaha, that self-revelation, that self-manifestation, that Spurti, that is the mystical part. And so Bhakti, in that sense, throughout is this blend of the rational and the mystical. So I'll summarize what I discussed today. Broadly, we're discussing the topic of how spiritual awakening occurs. Basically, we see Brahmaji's spiritual awakening and I discuss broadly three points based on an acronym, FAR. So F was, what was it? Frustration. So frustration can range from just dissatisfaction to downright devastation. So now generally, amid frustration, People seek relief mostly in the familiar. And that's why they will go towards the mainstream culture, the mainstream religion basically. Now of course a minority will seek relief in the unfamiliar, they are the rebellious people. So This is where mostly the right people will go. Those who will seek relief in the unfamiliar, they are seeking relief, will be in the alternative. There, so these are the people on the left. But either way, frustration is one of the key factors that actually begins the spiritual journey. So basically, when we are discussing this, instead of going the straight path, and somebody starts looking upwards, that could be because of something negative and something positive. So the negative is the frustration, the positive is the association. And what bubbles up from within is the mystical. So this is the... So A was association. So here we discussed how association, there can be varied elements within association, which a person may find cool, attractive, whatever it might be. But what we can, it might be the musical ability, it might be the behavioral skill, it might be intellectual, it might be cultural, whatever it may be. But broadly, what we can see is for this to work, the devotees should have the behavioral aspect is much more important than the devotional aspect over here. Now, if somebody is very rigid in following the rules, but that makes them better towards those who don't follow the rules, then they will not be. The behavioral aspect means a person should be broadly sattvic. And then such people can be assets who attract people towards Krishna. The last part was this reactivation. That the activation can be from the soul's eternal nature or the previous life's practice. So, either way, this activation has a mystical aspect to it. And these two 
is the rational what we can do and is reactivation is the mystical aspect that we wait for for ourselves as well as for others and this is almost it's like avashaha avashaha means it's not so much helpless as it is it is beyond our control it is beyond our control in a positive sense so that spuratya that spurti that that mercy we all need to wait so we follow the rules but we also understand that bhakti is more than the rules thank you very much hare krishna do we have time for maybe one question or comment yes please hare krishna bro as in the last point it's mentioned that it is soul's intrinsic nature to take to bhakti so when we hear in scripture that you know bhakti is beyond karma so why there is need of you know initial sukruti or something to actually take to person to bhakti why can't person directly take to bhakti why there is initial push needed or some like previous practice some practice is needed if, if one directly comes in touch with bhakti he can directly he should directly take to bhakti yeah that's the issue of debate you know that nitya siddha krishna prem sadhya kabunaye so different gaudiya scholars give trans- translate that verse in different ways so prabhupada translate that as saying that it means that love for krishna is dormant within everyone's heart so prabhupad focuses on the nitya siddha other gaudiya scholars focus on sadhya kabunaye they focus on that part that 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 is it is not awakenable so it is basically basically there are two ways of looking at it and um, there's elaborate discussion and there's some way to reconcile it also see basically um, with spirituality you can use two words for it one is dormant the other is fertile hmm? fertile means like you can use it for a soil now if we consider the soul to be like a fertile soil the fertile soil the soil has to be fertile for any harvest to happen but no matter how fertile the soil is unless some seed is planted hmm, nothing is going to happen over there and the seed comes externally so now that is what the metaphor is brahmand brahmite kona bhagyavan jeev guru krishna prasade pae bhakti lata beej so one is so the the heart the soul whatever word you want to use it over here here we can use the intelligence energy is the heart like a fertile soil in which the guru has to plant the beech hmm and prabhupad seems to take uh, sometime that tack he says that everybody is unfortunate and we have to make them fortunate hmm so when we give krishna bhakti that's when they become fortunate otherwise that bhagyavan how do they become bhagyavan we have to make them bhagyavan but on the other hand if say we consider it to be like a dormant creature say like uh, frogs going to hibernation during winter then now there might be some external change happening but they have the capacity to wake up that capacity to wake up is within them it is not something which has to be some external stimulus may trigger them but the capacity is within so basically does the soul have the capacity to love krishna within it or is the soul given the capacity to love krishna so that is that is the overall issue of debate and that also relates with the fall of the jiva right? it's a whole complicated thing but the key point is that at least the way i understand or reconcile it is that no material metaphor can precisely or exhaustively describe a spiritual reality hmm. so if we read uh, chaitanya shikshamrita by bhaktivinoda thakur there he does in some places seem to echo what prabhupada is saying some places can be read in different ways but the broad point is there is definitely something within the soul hmm. uh, the in the in the vedanta sutra commented the example is given that no matter how much you you what you do with stone you're not going to get oil out of it isn't it no matter what you do with stone so 
there has to be something intrinsic for oil to come out of it. You can use groundnut and then you crush it, you can get oil. You crush stone, no matter what you do, you're not going to get oil. So there is definitely something within the soul. Without that, no matter, even if something is given from outside, nothing is going to happen. So there is something within the soul. Now, what is the magnitude of what is innate within the soul? What is the magnitude of what comes from outside? Hmm? That is something which is difficult to say. Because even when we say that, so some examples could be given of somebody just taking up to bhakti without any bhakti influence. Hmm? Say, for example, when uh, Bilva Mangal Thakur started practicing bhakti, hmm? Chintamani just spoke one word, which was Chintamani a, de a devotee. That's not, it seems she lived in a culture where she understood about God. But it is not, no mention that she was herself a practicing devotee. She had a particular profession, which is not incompatible with devotion, but it's not exactly compatible so easily also. So, but it, in her case, it is said that her words triggered what Bilba Mangal Thakur's guru had taught him in a previous life. So, even when somebody seems to be awakening bhakti in this lifetime without any, any guru's influence, it could be that it is from a previous life. It could be the innate potential in the soul. So my understanding is this is not something which we need to uh, get too much into. Broadly speaking, there has to be some potentiality. And uh, there is enough reference in scripture to support what Prabhupada says. Like the whole Bhakti Vinod Thakur song, Jeeva Jago, Jeeva Jago. And it's not just Bhakti Vinod Thakur. The idea of a dream and wake spiritual realization being like awakening from a dream. That is very much there in the Bhagavatam also. So, there is enough basis for what Prabhupada is saying. And then, what we mean, what it means is that, uh, now, Chakravarti Pad in his uh, Madhuri Kandamani says that Bhakti can be awakened in two ways. Swabhaviki and Balin Utpadita. Swabhaviki means somebody has a natural attraction. Now, that means what? That it could be from a previous life. It could be referring to the soul's natural attraction. Which has, uh, but Bali Utpadita is by a forceful association of a devotee. So that's what we are talking about association. So it could be, so I think there is room for both of those. The key point is that Prabhupada's explanation is very much defensible based on scripture. And in general, in the domains which are connected uh, very much with the spiritual, it's a, it's a profoundly different domain. And it is very difficult to have the kind of certainty that we may have with respect to the domains that are more perceivable for us. So it's best to approach this with a certain degree of humility. Uh, humility in this case would mean a certain level of comfort with uncertainty. That you know, these are difficult things and that humility as comfort with uncertainty is uh, what is the foundation of achintya. Achinte Bheda Bhedi, right? the ultimate reality is unknowable. So basically, devotion, or you can say strong devotion, we can see it in two ways. One is strong devotion means faith, and faith means certainty. This is what is right, and I have no doubts about it. I accept, I accept it, and anybody who doesn't accept it is a deviant. Hmm? I was in Los Angeles, and there was uh, like a wall graffiti. And somebody had said, Jesus, Jesus is the answer. Hmm? And then next day somebody had come and put, a, put a, below another graffiti. But what is the question? <laughs> so, you know, generally, when somebody gives the answer, when there is no question, it just becomes redundant. It doesn't really work. Hmm? So, uh, strong devotion can also, within the tradition itself, be seen as humility. If there's strong devotion, then we understand the greatness of God. And then that brings a profound amount of humility. And that humility will bring comfort with uncertainty. That there are realities far bigger than what I can perceive. And different people may have different perceptions of that reality. So we can live with it. This is the mood of 10.9 in the Gita when Krishna says, those who are Buddha, those who are enlightened, they bodhayantaha parasparam, they enlighten each other. If they are enlightened, why do they need to enlighten each other? 
because the object of enlightenment is infinitely complex and we can always keep learning more and more about krishna so that's why i think uh, with respect to these domain that whatever way the spiritual awakening of, uh, occurs is it that somebody has some devotee has to come in somebody's life and without that it can't happen well that is the normal way it will happen for most people but can it not happen in some other way well who are we to legislate that so if we see genuine bhakti if is a real authentic attraction towards the divine in someone who is not come, come, connected with the tradition then we can say maybe it's from previous life maybe it's dormant to the soul and we are basically navigating into territory that is not comprehensible with certainty for the rational mind so we adopt humility thank you very much grantraj shrimad bhagavatam ki shila prabhu pad ki gaur bhakt vrind ki cha tai gaur prema vande